Now, my Pacific War videos are quite regular. Get comments of people suggesting the Japanese should have invaded Pearl Harbor and or the big island Hawaii in the initial surprise attack on the 7th December 1941. Additionally, the authors of the excellent book Shattered Sword have also a homepage combined fleet.com where they also get similar questions. Although in their case, the question usually evolves around the hypothetical scenario that the Japanese wanted midway and that they should then invade Pearl Harbor and the chances of that. Now, actually here we get into a bit like historical accuracy here because the Japanese actually considered at one point invading Hawaii, basically in March 1942. And it had the following timetable. Midway and some of the Aleutians would be seized in early June, triggering a decisive battle with the US Pacific Fleet. Johnston and Palmyra were to be occupied in August. The attack on the big island Hawaii would begin in October, culminating in assault on Oahu, where Pearl Harbor is located, in March 1943. Now, Parshall made a lot of strong arguments on the homepage that this had no chance of success, even assuming a tremendous victory of the Japanese at the Battle of Midway. He also dealt with the December 1941 scenario, mainly focused that it would never have happened from a strategic side. I thus will add more on the tactical and operational capabilities of both the Japanese and the US forces at the time. The points brought forward might seem obvious to some, yet I think some can learn a lot about warfare and military history if we tackle these questions. Let's start with the actual attack on Pearl Harbor, as it happened. I think some don't really understand how incredible dangerous this attack was in the first place. The Japanese used their best carriers and drove them across the whole Pacific. We are talking about the distance of almost 4000 miles here. To give you some idea how far that is, the distance between San Francisco and Pearl Harbor is around 2300 miles and the distance between Berlin and Moscow is 1000 miles. And the Japanese were clearly aware of this. The Japanese naval general staff pointed out that the essential surprise element could easily be lost by a chance meeting with a foreign ship or plane, that the ships of the attack force would have to refuel at the sea in the stormy waters of the North Pacific and that Yamamoto would be gambling the entire first line carrier striking force on a single operation, one which might well provide futile if the American fleet happened to be absent from Pearl Harbor. So why did they pull through in the first place? Well, after two war games in which in one the Japanese lost actually two carriers, Yamamoto resorted basically to blackmail. Although the results of these war games were far from conclusive, Yamamoto continued to insist on the Pearl Harbor plan even threatening to resign if it were not approved. In October 1941, Admiral Nagano gave his reluctant consent. So we have already an extremely reluctant general staff. And the issue is for an invasion compared to the strike that happened against Pearl Harbor, you need two more things. First, the Imperial Japanese Army and second, more ships. Now the Japanese are well known for their inter-service rivalry. Generally, the army was concerned with everything about the continent, whereas the Navy looked at the Pacific. And here is a bit of an issue because it was primarily the Japanese army which had specialized in amphibious warfare, the navy to a lesser degree. Only after the Doolittle Raid in 1942, the army seriously considered the Pacific an important area. The Doolittle Raid accomplished what neither the combined fleet nor the navy general staff had been able to do. It convinced army leaders that the Pacific was an important theater. For the first time, the army general staff paid serious attention to the Pacific in general and to Hawaii in particular. Yet we are not even at war yet. The invasion of Pearl Harbor would have required at least two divisions, even for the very optimistic planning of the Japanese in 1942, which assumed two divisions, but was later stacked up. And this required the Imperial Japanese Army assigning those, something very unlikely. But we are not finished yet. The other problem is you have to add a lot of ships to your fleet. This is a major issue. See, the initial strike fleet consists of vast vessels. The issue is transport ships and assault ships are not fast. Furthermore, these ships need to be protected as well. In other words, you don't just gamble your first line carrier fleet, you also gamble, gamble two divisions and more ships in a strike fleet that is slower and larger, thus easier to detect and way harder to coordinate as well. But let's look at some data here. The Japanese strike fleet left historically at Takan Bay on the 26th November at 0900 
and on the 6th December at around 2100 it was about 400 miles from Pearl Harbor. Now here's the issue. Three days before on the 3rd December the fleet had to refuel. This was without difficulty. Then again with a larger fleet it would have taken longer and added more complications. Anyway, let's get to the point. Namely that the fleet had to increase its speed on the 3rd of December. With the smoother seas the force which had been sailing at an economical speed of 13 knots increased its speed to 26 knots in order to reach the launch site on schedule. Now here's the first issue, although an average speed of 13 knots doesn't seem much at first, this is not the case for non-combat ships, namely for transport ships and assault ships, this was a big deal. The first landing craft carrier that was designed as such was the Shinju Maru, she had a max speed of about 19 knots. She would have the capacity of around 1400 men. The issue is her cruise speed was likely below 30 knots, which would have increased her fuel consumption and thus reduced her range. Additionally, she was one of the few exceptions. Other Japanese transport vessels usually had a max speed of 9 to 10 knots at, at the time, according to Partial. More modern Japanese amphibious assault ships like the SS class landing ships had a max speed of around 14 knots and a range of around 3000 nautical miles. Yet it had only a carrying capacity of 170 men. If we assume about two divisions, we are talking about 30 to 50,000 men, depending on which type of division you use and how many additional forces you take with you. So even with the assumption that the Japanese had plenty of landing ships, which they had not, they would have needed at least 20 to 40 landing ships that could carry around 2,000 men, which is above the number of the ships we mentioned and but of which they only had very few. This would have also slowed down the whole operation due to the limited speed, not to mention coordination and additional escort vessels. Now difficult as it was to conduct such landings becomes probably more apparent if we consider the following. In fact, it would not be until early 1944 when the US Marine Corps and the US Navy began perfecting their respective arts that the naval force could reliably transport divisional sized units across thousands of miles of ocean, park offshore an island bastion, crush its air power, land assault troops in the face of heavy fire and then support the troops ashore for weeks at a time. The Japanese never possessed any of these essential characteristics of amphibious power protection. Anyway, I'm not yet out of nails and you are still watching, so let's change the sides for a moment. For this we look at the defenses of Pearl Harbor. In the interwar years the defenses were modernized and extended several times. The Hawaiian Department Engineering Section, aided by the selecting use of private engineering firm 2, undertook a large variety of projects. Between 1907 and 1938 the army spent about 150 million on defenses of Uhau twice as much as was spent on the naval base itself. This includes beach defenses like pillboxes, ammunition depots within the hills, an underground command center, numerous fire control stations and command centers for the defense of Pearl Harbor. Additionally, the Navy also extended the defenses too. There was also a 1940 program by the US Army, yet I'm not sure how much of the work was actually finished by December 1941. So for now we just discount that, because there's already plenty there. Now according to at least one author, the Japanese were leaders in amphibious landings. There's just one major problem, they were not. Yes, the Japanese conducted many amphibious landings and were quite experienced. Additionally they also had developed very good landing craft, namely the Nehatsu in the late 1920s. But the devil as so often lies in the details. First. The main issue with Japanese amphibious landing was that they were mostly conducted against undefended beachheads and during night. Second, they stopped innovating on their landing crafts. And third, the army was mostly focused on fighting the Soviets. We do know that the Japanese army continually honed its armor, infantry, artillery and engineer doctrine during the 1930s and that its capstone manual, the revised service field regulations, appeared in September 1938. The 1938 regulations, however, were the culmination of doctrinal thought about how to fight the Soviets, that is, continental, not amphibious warfare. Yet we even have far better hands-on information about how the Japanese performed against US forces in amphibious landing 
at nearly the time frame we are talking about, December 1941. One day after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Battle of Wake Island started and it lasted till the 23rd of December 1941. The main difference is that in this case the landing was performed mainly by Japanese Navy forces, namely the Special Naval Landing Forces, not the Imperial Japanese Army, although later on they added some units. Wake was defended by about 440 Marines, 70 sailors and more than 1000 civilian construction workers, yet some of those Marines were pilots and or service personnel for the planes. As such, the task of physically defending the island against the landing fell to 15 officers and 373 men of the 1st Defense Battalion. Basically the base was understaffed. Personal shortages limited the overall command of the Defense Battalion to manning only 6 of its 12 3 inch anti aircraft guns and half of its machine guns. All six 5 inch Seacoast guns were manned, but the Marines had a limited of conventional fire control equipment and no radar. Further, the island or better islands were not particularly well suited for a defense and there was a lack of barbed wire, naval and landmines. The small size of Wake also precluded a mobile defense. By elimination, Major Devereaux planned the defense at the water's edge. Compounding his shortage of gun crews was a complete lack of infantry to conduct even local counterattacks. By Saturday, December 1941, the 1st Defense Battalion had its guns mounted. The Marines held simulated gun drills, but no firing. Their first chance actually to fire the guns would be against the Japanese landing. Meanwhile, the Japanese had support from land-based aircraft based on the Marshall Islands. In the initial attacks, they lost two destroyers to the coastal guns. Later, they landed around 1,500 of the troops outside of the range of these guns. Wake finally fell. Nevertheless, the result was quite interesting. Depending on the sources, the US to Japanese loss ratio ranged from around 1 to 5.7 according to one source or even 1 to 8. Note that one source counted general losses versus the second counted kills. Yet here the Marines defended unsuited terrain with a lack of material and men against a force of at least three times larger in size. Now this brings us back to the defenses at Pearl Harbor. Now some might argue, but the shock of the initial carrier strike on Pearl Harbor might limit the fighting capabilities of defenders on Pearl Harbor. And I agree, this indeed might have happened, but there's one problem. The landing force can't immediately attack with the carriers. These were 275 miles off Hawaii when they attacked. And as such, when the landing ships escorted by other ships would finally reach Pearl Harbor, defenders would likely be well dug in and well prepared as well. By the end of the first wave, the coastal artillery troops were beginning to disperse to their assigned defensive positions. The heavy guns, fire control stations, and beach defenses were soon manned in preparation for landings that never came. Additionally, even if we assume that the Japanese would attack with a ridiculously high number of 50,000 men, they likely would only achieve a numerical superiority of 2 to 1, since the garrison at that time was about 25,000 men, and I think this doesn't include actually naval personnel. Even if the Japanese achieved a successful landing, they might take control of parts of the islands. Yet the problem is now, their supply lines are extremely overextended and they are lacking ships. Especially considering that at that point in time they prepared or conducted operations against the Philippines, Thailand, Hong Kong, Dutch East Indies, Malaya, Guam, Wake, the Gilberts, the Bismarck Islands and New Guinea as pointed out by Partial. So bringing in supplies, let alone further reinforcements was out of question. The only chance would have been if the U.S. forces would have surrendered, but then again the Japanese would have still needed to bring in supplies for their garrison, the civilians, the prisoners of war, and they had not enough shipping and they would have to provide escorts for the shipping as well. Or as Marshall puts it, puts it in short the Japanese simply did not possess the amphibious and logistical abilities to assault, capture and hold the Hawaiian Islands. And we should not forget here that in 1942 the US leadership was so aggressive that it risked losing an aircraft carrier to drop some bombs on the Japanese main islands. I don't think they would have fought twice throwing everything against the Japanese convoy in the Pacific trying to reach Pearl Harbor after it had been conquered. To summarize, the Japanese invasion of Pearl Harbor makes look Operation Sea Lion like a walk in the park during a warm summer night while fairies sing in the background. 
I hope you learned something new. Special thanks to Naval Institute Press for sending me two complimentary copies of their books that were used in this video. Also thank you to Justin for providing further sources and Drachenirfel for details on the Japanese landing ships. Special thanks to Michael for sending books that helped making this video. Also a big thank you to all my supporters on Patreon. As always, source the link in the description. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you for watching and see you next time.